and then the Palestinians can't stand it anymore, and then they blow up. And Israel said, you can't possibly want us to make peace with people who act like this. But in every peace negotiation, whether it's in Norway, in Geneva, anywhere in the Middle East, Israel will agree to stuff and pays no attention. Pays no attention. So the Palestinians lose land, 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 people. They can't, Israel can't, they have the skill and the power to do it. It's the fourth largest nuclear power in the world if you're feeling sorry for them. Anyway, um, they can't go ahead and annex the West Bank, which is what they want to do because all the water for the Shefela, for the rest of Israel, comes from the West Bank. But if they <clears throat> annex it and say this is part of Israel now, they got a couple million more Palestinian citizens, which they don't want. So I, they want to make life as uncomfortable as possible so everybody goes away and they say, well, nobody's living on this land so we can have it. Anyway, this is just a step. Hamas, they know, they get it. They, they know the price they're paying for this latest attack. I mean, they're not crazy. In fact, so Hamas leadership is occasionally brighter, almost always brighter than the PLO leadership that, that lives on the West Bank, Arafat's crowd. Anyway, I'm interested that he, Israel tattled. I mean, it's very interesting, the dynamics of the Middle East. And then somebody said, Oh, Hamas, Gaza is the size, what does it say in the paper, the size of Las Vegas, the entire Gaza Strip. It actually used to be bi bigger. And I'll, I've been stuck in Gaza for a week once with a, some, a, a, a blockade of some sort. I couldn't get out. But um, it's smaller than it used to be. Yes, there's several million people living there with no income. But something's wrong, <laughs> wrong with Gaza. This is. Jane Wolfe. Even in biblical times, people didn't want much to do with Gaza. Now, from my experience, it's a pretty beach that sort of runs, well, it used to run from Lebanon down to Egypt, but now it's squished off just down here. But something's wrong. It wasn't even very popular in biblical times. I don't know what's wrong with Gaza. So it's the water? It's on the water. It's on the, Medi uh, on the Mediterranean. In fact, I have a T-shirt from the United Nations that is fantastic. It's got a little UN label here. This is when things they thought were going to get better. And underneath it says the Gaza Strip Club. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I could sell that thing for a lot of money. But anyway. Um, it's sort of, I guess, a crummy piece of land. Nobody wants it much, but it's, it's basically the, what it is now where Hamas is. It, uh, it's just a refugee camp. And Israel is making noise about setting nuclear bombs off in that tiny little area. Yeah, well, they're good. But Hamas knew it was going to get sort of... I mean, I hate to be crass, but Middle Eastern... Politics is fairly crass, and Hamas has got Gaza's got too many people. They're gonna lose a lot of people because of this. But maybe it'll be easier to feed. I mean, I hate to be cynical, you know. But are, am I? We ready? Ready, real? Is do I have a microphone or I just talk? So you don't have a microphone today. Okay, well, Who's Bob? Bob gave me a microphone, and I found that harder than not. Pete. Yes. Okay, all right. Today, we need, first we're going to address Rosetta's question. Um, everybody takes, prefers revenge. All of us, that's our intuition. Somebody hurts you, kill them. Life would be a lot easier if they were dead. That is a normal human reaction. Just the way lying is human. And we all, we all, by the way, we all sin, we all lie, we all do everything. The, the point is to sort of get control of it. But anyhow, every, re, revenge is, is much more natural and much more immediate. 
but it's not helpful if you're interested in peace. And peace, we uh, we all I, and I get a bit mixed up about what peace is. Peace is not an extended day off where you can just fill around and do whatever you want and as my favorite kind of day is a dawdle day where I take hours to do something could take half an hour. Uh, <laughs> but um, peace is extremely difficult. Well, let's put it this way. It is absolutely impossible if you're going to try to do it through your brain. You cannot. Peace is part of your spiritual dimension. It is your spiritual part of it. It's peace, joy, and love are the three air, water, and food of the spirit. And as I've said a million times, the brain cannot do spiritual stuff. It tries hard because we won't give the spirit a chance. So we want the brain to figure it all out and we'll all live happily ever after. Now that's never going to happen. Suffering is going to be there. Your neighbor's going to die. Your cat's going to die. Somebody's going to kill each other by mistake even. So, but our first response to being put in danger, to, to not being safe. Our first response when we're not as safe and we can see the action that did it is to kill them. Get rid of them. Go away. Just have that part of your life disappear. And the thing about switching to your spiritual life you still have that feelings outside your heart, but inside you can live with the hearts of the people who did you wrong. You don't have to think they're the most wonderful people in the world. You don't have to ever see them again in person, but you can respect the fact that they live. Now, how, why God let such a wretched person live? Don't leave, those are brain questions. Trying to figure it out. The brain's always trying to figure it out. And that's good, and it's good at figuring it out. I say all the time, you're not going to ask your heart how to get from here to Denver. You know, that's ridiculous. That's the thing for the brain, the kind of stuff the brain loves. Ch -ch -ch Turn right here at the... I don't have a car that talks to me or, or a phone either. But, <laughs> or if I do, I don't know how to use that part. But anyhow, I know the car doesn't. But uh, anyway, the brain does all that stuff great. But it's very poor at spirituality. It's a data collector. So you're going to, but it's fast. The brain is also kind of fast. So that's the first reaction. When I'm not safe, kill them. Just get rid of them. That's a brain kind of thing. Your body too. Anyway, but if you're going to start using the spiritual dimension of your body, of your of who you are, so that all three parts of you work, you've got to understand that peace is a spiritual thing. It's very interesting, it's sort of haunting that, as I told you, I preached last Sunday, and there's a little piece, they use track two, and there's a little statement from Isaiah, a little, and he, most of the lessons are a tremendous downer. I planted grapes, they're horrible. <laughs> I ran it out there, the vineyard, they're horrible. <laughs> you know, throw all those people away. But anyhow, but the end, of, towards the end of the little Isaiah, five verses, it said, I expected justice and got bloodshed. Mm -hmm. I expected righteousness and heard a cry. And I thought, woo, did they set me up for this latest thing and for life anyway. 
We don't, justice, justice is a part of peace. And you're not gonna have any peace without justice and you're not gonna have any justice without peace. They go together. And this is hard for everybody, particularly the privileged who are used to justice being when it's convenient. I mean, I've had wealthy friends who go up to the police and their sons got, you know, pulled in a DUI. And they go down to the police station and that DUI disappears and they have a lovely Christmas party. I wonder how. You know, we're all used to that. That's a little higher level than I operate on, but I mean, but we're all used to that kind of fix it. Anyhow, revenge is normal. It's not going to work. But you do feel you're like you're doing something. And that's, and that's very important to human beings, and particularly important when you're not using your spiritual self at all. But if we didn't learn much from the Bishop Tutu and all the forgiveness and reconciliation process, we didn't use much, but if you study it a little bit, some amazing things happen. Some man had just killed a woman's son for the hell of it. And they eventually got so they could relate the mom and that guy. Now that's a little unusual and you don't have to do that. But you have to say, I'm not going to take revenge. I'm not going to kill him. This is hard. I'm not saying it's easy. We want to take revenge. Because we're not living our spiritual selves, like our whole selves. We're not being whole. We don't even give ourselves a chance to be whole. Okay, and I wouldn't spend too much time on the Israeli-Hamas situation. I'd work a little bit on yourself and on the, and them, and you can hold the Israeli soldiers and stuff in your heart and the, and the Hamas, but you don't have to take a side. You can love them. And love is not hooked up with emotions. I mean, it can be. Emotions, feelings, romance, stuff, all that stuff. We, that's the kind of thing the brain uses for love. Those are all connectors, but they're highly unstable. We all know that. We all know that. Anyhow, what was I going to talk about? Oh, I was going to talk about healing and stuff. 90% of forgiveness, which is never talked about, is healing. You have to get over it. You can say, okay, you can do the forgiveness part. I'm not going to take revenge. Not today. I'm not going to kill him. And I'm not going to sit there and be passive aggressive for the rest of that person's life just so he or she knows their punch is shit. And that's what I think. You're not going to take short-term revenge, and you're not going to take long-term revenge. Now, sometimes in order not to take revenge, you have to leave the building. That's okay. That's preferable to killing the guy or spending a lifetime saying he's a shit <coughs> and letting him know you think he's a shit. Okay, number one is I'm not going to take revenge. That's the forgiveness part. It's the littlest part. It's the littlest part of the whole forgiveness ball of wax. The next part is cleansing, getting rid of stuff on your wounds, and healing. Somebody who sinned against you, and remember, for purposes of our generation, it, well, I think it goes all worldwide, but on always, but. A sin is something you do or is done to you that makes it harder for you to love or even be loved, harder for you to rejoice, be joyful, or even participate in somebody else's joy, harder for you to be peaceful. That's what a sin is. It's very destabilizing. And it's destabilizing to the spirit. 
but we want to solve it with the mind and the body, shoot them. Anyway, that's about like saying the answer to your broken leg is prayer. Well, and leaving the sentence there, not prayer that you find a surgeon to heal it, not prayer that somebody you know can set it, not prayer that it'll set it to, not anything. It's just, as my dog Kenneth Goss used to say, ice cream is good, but if you put it on your skin knee, it's not gonna do any good at all. <laughs> you know, it's got its place. But that's not it. So we used it. We, our problem is we use different wrong, out, good things applied incorrectly. Okay, so somebody hurts you, does something that hurts you, sins. And remember, we don't jump over the sin. We don't say, I forgive you for hurting me, of hurting me. You say, I forgive your nasty words which hurt me and destabilized me. You forgive sins. Now there is a place somewhere, maybe, but it's often not necessary to forgive a person, but that's a little tricky because God created that person. And you can forgive, but you're better off forgiving the sins. And, and then the best palliative for saying, I forgive you for hurting me, is this gratitude. Is to say, thank you for allowing me to forgive. Thank you for allowing me not to take revenge. Thank you for allowing me to give her a chance to be whole too. So you forgive sins. And God forgives sins. So don't jump over. We want to just get the We want to just get the person. We just want to wipe out Hamas. But what we want to wipe out is where'd they get those rockets? Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, I think they got a little sly and got their help from Iran. That, that, that was a little sly. Anyway, um, forgive the sins. Now, you have to heal up from that destabilization from the, your being sinned against, something that made you feel terribly insecure, unsafe, un, unfed, unhired, it just makes you feel terrible. You have to heal up from that. Forgiveness, the, forgive, the act of forgiveness does not help with your healing. I mean, it helps with your healing because you did that. You don't have to worry about revenge. When it comes up, you say, nope, out the door. Not allowed in the community center. Anyhow, but you forgive this. You, you have to heal up. You have to th start letting God or your spirit or whatever you, I forget all those words for God. The AA has a lot of them. But anyway, you've got to let yourself start to heal. And you have to get, when you heal with your heart, you let spiritual things like angels. I know everybody thinks I just flipped off. All the mainline religions think you're a little silly when you flip off into angels. Because we don't see them, so they may, must not exist. That's the brain. Brain has a little trouble with angels. Heart has no trouble with angels at all. And they have no, uh, most of the angels, the, all these angels have um, non-invasive hands and most of there's lots of different si kinds of angels, just like there are lots of different kinds of dogs and stuff like that. There are lots of different kinds of angels that do different things. And they, they you know, send hounds and sight hounds and herding dogs and stuff like that. The angels are, are like, and same with human beings, um, and most, most of them are in some form of the healing business. And they can work on your heart, you, but you have to allow it. You can't 
take your car to the garage and to be fixed, then drive off. I mean, if you want the help, you've got to hang around. They're not going to try to fix your carburetor while you're going 90 on the interstate. You know, they're going to fix it. They're working on your heart. And it takes a long time. All healing, body, mind, and spirit, takes a long time. Much longer than it takes to get hurt. We've discussed all this a million times. You, it takes a paper cut a long time to heal. That stupid little thing. It'll take a week or two. Well, you can't just... It's very difficult for us to understand in our instant culture. We like immediate gratification. But healing takes a long time. And that sin that destabilizes you and makes you feel terribly insecure and depressed and anxious and stuff like that. It doesn't exist by itself. It exists in a, I've, we discussed this, the, you, these big vats or sores inside of you. We don't have 40 million hertz. We have about three, sometimes four sort of containers for, for our hertz. And it, it usually just slips into one of those. And they're serious and dangerous, but there's also kind of an agenda for the healing. But as long as you're in the hospital and take time every day for the angels to come by or anybody, you will get better. You will get better. And then you say thank you all the time. Thank you is the most wonderful dressing on your wounds. Thank you for letting me forgive you. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for working on healing. And every day, you don't ask to be forgiven a million times for the sins you committed. You did something and somebody's very badly hurt. One time I said something to my mother as a teenager or something, and she was a very joyful person. And she just went, Psh. I was being terrible. And I thought, I really hurt her. I really hurt her. I really hurt her. By being such a grouch. And my tendency is still now to want to ask her or ask God for forgive me for doing that, for those words that just took the joy out of her. Not forever. I still want to be forgiven, but I know I have to stop and say, thank you for forgiving me for doing that. You've got to go with the palliative care, not just the, they, the angels are there, two types <coughs> that'll work on their deep wounds, and there's a whole type that you might as well access almost all the time, too, that works on getting rid of the parasites that infect your wounds. Worse than they are. They're usually on the surface. They're like flies and mosquitoes and you know, all those things that come along to make your life better. Uh, but anyhow, if you take time daily, your wounds get better. But it's a healing process. Your heart has to they heal. It, and one of the tragedies of not working on it is your heart can't die. It cannot die. It's God's presence, soul, and all that is God's presence here on earth in you. And it will just go off somewhere. You came from somewhere, you go off somewhere. You change characters, roles, whatever, I don't know. Not my business. But um, anyway, you might as well go off in good shape. And be healed. We don't take any time for healing. And nobody says, oh, just forgive us the sins. Well, that's right. But a lot of people assume you know. I don't know whether they know anymore, but I mean, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Fine. But we also have to get well. 
Forgiveness is the first step. But we have to heal, and you have a healing team, and the healing, people on the healing team do not except in extremely rare instances, include any of the sinners against you, any of the people who destabilize you. Those people may be in your life forever, but as terms of getting well in your heart, so your heart shines lighter. Oh, you want to know about light? I thought, I have some two lamp, very beautiful lamps that require a tiny bulb. They don't have much room from the har harp up, so I had a tiny. So I buy a tiny bulb and I, turn, I put it in last night. You can barely see. I thought, what's wrong with this? Seven watts. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's beautiful. <laughs> well, what's it? It's a night light. It's, it's right. It, <laughs> But I didn't know, I just saw, I saw a teeny bulb there with its normal base. I thought, that's mine. Anyway, back to the store. And I don't have any regular bottom light, night lights. Anyway, such a problem, such a first world problem. Wrong wattage on my bulb. <laughs> Anyhow, um, okay, healing, you got to heal. Why it doesn't say forgiveness and healing together I don't know, I guess there was some era where people were smarter spiritually than, spiritually than they are now. But well, we weren't making such tremendous demands on the brain as we are now. Now we did pretty soon the, much assume the brain can fix anything. I mean, you have to go to school. You have to go to brain school. You, you get, I don't know, what that, the, if you don't send your kids to school or prove that they're being homeschooled, I think you're in trouble. You have to go to brain school. Everybody knows you have to take care of your body whether you do or not. But nobody says anything about they Well, they think if you go to community worship once a week, that ought to take care of your spirituality. But who gets anything out of that? I mean, not enough. You might get a spoonful of food. Well, that's a real stupid way to eat once a week, a spoonful. I mean, there's a, community is necessary, and that's one of the things that's being, hopefully being repaired now. Not always very constructively, but the death of the uh, extended family was terrible. Remember that I said I was a week in Gaza? <coughs> I was in a house with four rooms and a courtyard for a week and 19 people, mm. many of whom were babies, mm. and nobody ever cried. Mm. You just, there's so many resources there, you, kids driving you crazy, you just hand it off to somebody else. It's the most amazing thing you ever saw. And nobody arguments, no arguments, no fist fights and stuff like that. And you know all 19 people didn't love each other. I mean, you know, didn't think each other was the finest person that ever lived. No crime. Or if they started to whimper, hand it. And the way they'd manage, by the way, is the women sleep in one room, the men sleep in another. And if there's another bedroom, either for the head of the family and his, their, that couple, whoever's sort of head of the family, except when somebody's pregnant and having a baby, almost always, uh, <laughs> they get that group. Anyway, it's amazing <coughs> that the, the, the coming back of the family are small communities, which I think are the base. In, in, this nuclear family is way too unstable to be the basis society, the individual of the nuclear family, it's very unstable. Um, but um, the small family or the small tribe, that's a good base for community. And the small tribe can get along with another small tribe. 
but I guess it's considered a small family, the 19 of us. Well, three of us, it must be only like 16, because three of us were stuck there. But you never had a sense that you were stuck. Anyhow, heal. You've got to heal. You've got to not take revenge. And if somebody takes revenge on you, well, the Jesus word is turn your other cheek, <laughs> which we don't think is good advice. We want to kill them back, if you're going to test me. But get into your heart first. And if you, if you, if you die, it's better than taking revenge back. Okay, anybody have any questions? Did that help you at all, Rosetta? Nope. You still want to kill him? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. So healing really has to do with being in your heart with the angels. Yes, you have to stay there and get well. Just the way you stay in the hospital and get well when you're, something else physically is wrong with you. That's why that Ed's grandson was two months in Boston Children's to get well. So we can have his leg okay down here. Anyway. Can you say more about passive aggression? What? We all know what it is. Do we? We all know it's being uh, consciously or unconsciously being nasty. Also called microaggression. When you, we well, all know it. When you, you you're nasty to somebody, you, sometimes unconsciously, you just want them to know that they're no good. But, but you can you can take yourself out of the building, as you said. Yeah. Without being passive aggressive. Yes. I have to walk, I, every night I have a, ten, I'm a pitiful at night, I'm a morning person. I think I told you, I asked God, I said I would like to be nicer and more profound and everything at night, and he said to, and I said, I knew God was gonna say, okay, let's work on that. And God said, too bad, <laughs> try it in the morning, you're a morning person. But I tend to get passive aggressive, sorry for myself. Nobody cares about me. I got feeling lonely and stuff. Oh, that's just get in your heart and go to bed. <laughs> I mean, really. But it's, it's self-pity is a, is, a, is a sort of entryway into a passive aggressive, because you're sure you're gonna take it out on somebody else. It's their fault that nobody hit, pays attention to you, that they're their only subject that they're interested in. You know, they don't care about you, but you care about them, particularly if they behave nicely. Anyway. What, yeah? What are, what are the three or four containers that all the hurts okay. go into? One is everything, a, a container holds all the betrayal and abandonment you've ever felt. From the day you hit the, got out of the womb to today. That's one, betrayal and abandonment. Another one is hopelessness or despair, which is the same word, but slightly different take. All the sort of failure to grow, things that have stopped you from growing, from being interested. And I'm not saying, I'm interested in things that would be helpful to you. I'm not saying you lost interest in becoming a gymnast. I'm, you know, that's going to happen or not. But, but, but most everybody in this room, I suspect, is not on that track, um, even at, at athletic. Um, somebody was trying to sell me something the other day. She said, if you drink this, you know, your muscles are just going to feel so much better. I said, and I, I'm going to be able to lift my arms and st yeah. because of my arthritis. Well, I don't know about that. Anyway, uh, 
Anyhow, I bought it, I'm a sucker. Not because I think it'll do any well. <laughs> good, I want to help him out. Um, but anyhow, abandonment and, and, and betrayal, hopelessness, and failure to grow. And the third one is destruction. Things that have happened that have actually destroyed part of who you are. Things like sexual abuse, things like that. So in terms of the Lord's Prayer, you know, where we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Would you put it, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive the sins? Because oh yeah, I would. The, 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 the later translations, I think, say, "Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us." Yeah, I, I would say, stop at the sin. Now, the fourth category of wounds is uh, what I call character wounds. The big, and it, it's, it for some reason it's not as big as the three others. It's a sort of seven, the ten, the deadly sins wounds. I didn't hear this, this, uh, the fourth container, should you have one for stuff that doesn't fit in the other three, <clears throat> are, are char sins of character, wrath, avarice, sloth, pride, lust, anger, greed. Gluttony. Those are, those are the character sins. But don't, and, and they can be worked on. Just don't hop in that bucket first. And don't, see which one that the angels are gonna work on. They have an agenda. And it's generally not yours. Do we have to know what it is? What? Do we have to know what their agenda is? No. no. Just let them work and pay, say thank you. I probably should do a whole class on gratitude. So, so are, you, are you saying to let the angels do their work? Are you saying, is that like sitting in silence and focusing on that? Um, you don't necessarily have to focus, just sit and let things happen. And try to dump your mind. If you, you, you can push your mind, your mind or, the, or I let the angels do it because I'm so lazy. Push it by behind your heart. Then you can't see, you're sitting there like a dunce. You're just sitting there. That's a good place to be, dunce. So I know we're mostly focusing on ourselves, but if you're mentoring someone spiritually in you, how would you start to help them understand how to heal their wounds? Would you start with gratitude? Would you start with sitting in silence? Is it unique to each person? It's pretty much just sit there and listen to what you're supposed to say. Don't figure it out. It's, it's, sometimes it's the same thing you tell everybody every time first, what if you don't. It depends on the person. It depends on where their heart is to be able to hear. Because you're working on their spirit, you're working on their spiritual health, one third of who you are, you have to talk to the spirit. You don't talk to their big toe. Well, you can, but I don't know that it's gonna work, unless the big toe is hanging out in the heart. But anyway, um, it kind of depends. Every time, not just when you start, every time you're with that person or communicate in some way with that person. I mean, and sometimes, I mean, I, that's what I do is help people with their spiritual stuff. 
You know, I don't know what I'm going to say when you walk in the room. Well, most of the time they're not ready to hear, but just a tiny, they're tiny what? little bit. Most of the time they're not even ready to hear, but just a tiny, tiny little oh, bit. Oh, tiny, tiny little bit. That's exactly right. And you, it's, you remind me of that, what I say all the time. When you're, most of us are starving spiritually. Or else we've been living on junk food or whatever. Most of us are starving. You do not feed a starving body a feast. They'll die. You feed them a little eye dropper of food and then maybe two eye droppers a little bit later if, if somebody's been body's been messed up in the ocean cold you don't warm it up right away little by little by little or it'll die But your heart knows how much something buddy can take. <coughs> and what you should be working all the time. I have, I have a friend who tends to take herself very seriously. Very seriously. And the other day I said, Why don't you learn to hum? I couldn't hear what you hum, said. Hum, just hum, something hum. stupid. Hum. And I did that recently on my Facebook too, somebody who takes himself seriously. I said, learn, learn how to whistle. I'm a great whistler, he said. Who knew? But he stopped taking himself so fucking seriously. And we discussed whistling in showers. You have to listen to how, how you're supposed to speak from the heart. You have to listen it. And it's going to be different every time. If somebody's immensely grieving and is upset like that, you're not going to tell them to whistle. You know, a, a nice hug is probably the, the best you can do there. Or a pat on the back. Hug may be too much. Anyhow, it all depends on your listening to what you're supposed to say. But it seems like listening for what to say in the moment has nothing to do with that particular moment. With what? That particular moment. No, to your brain it doesn't, no. Right. Don't, don't keep trying to be a partner with your brain. Your brain's supposed to be a partner with your heart at best, but generally it likes a day off. Nothing better than a stupid day. We all figuring, figuring, figuring. The poor old brain works over, overtime, and it makes overtime mistakes. What time are we speaking? We're getting close to overtime. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Okay, don't come next week. Skip a week. Next week's what, the 19th? Uh, yes. Yep, you're still gone. Yep. Come, to, come to seven days after the 19th, what would that be? 26. Huh? 26. 26? Come to 26. I have a look, look at Renee, she can add. <laughs>
That's good. Brain's working. <laughs> okay, everybody. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good trip. I will. You have to put Facebook pictures of your trip. Oh, I will post on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you going? Uh, Portugal and Morocco. Oh, wow. I'll be traveling on the 26th. Well, you can pray for us. I will. <laughs> Thank you. All about angels, I just think of them more biblically. And what I'm hearing from you, I know that they're all around, but for me, how, what could I read or look at? Stop it. Just open your heart. Okay. And say, I would like to be healed, or I'd like to be cleansed off my wounds and stuff like that, and see what happens. Okay. See what sensation. No, would. Well, oh, one of the first things I do tell people if, they, if they're making an appointment to work on their spiritual life is to stop reading. Stop reading religious shit. She's told me that so many times. <laughs> I have to sneak off and do it. <laughs> That's right. And not talk to her about it. Oh. <laughs> but God, she knows. Yes. Well, I'll ask, he tell, I'll ask a question. Just say you're reading that religious shit. Again. That's right. <laughs> Stop there. reading. You have some experiences. Ty, you can come get this thing if you're tired of it. Very good. Um, because I was thinking, um, there's some books like from Richard Rohr and he's um, a good. He's if you just want to read about it, but stop applying it to yourself. Gotcha. <laughs> I mean, stop. Get on your own two feet. Richard Rohr does not have to carry you around, nor does the Dalai Lama, nor does Bishop Tutu, nor does Mother Teresa, nor does anybody. You are able to walk spiritually whole. You walk on your feet, with your mind, and in your soul. The angels are there whether you see them or not. That's right. Right. And if you want to start the day like me, when I start my work, I have, well, my work comes second. The first is the garbage can, <laughs> um, which I'm almost, uh, I started them, the meds, when we went to the Parliament of World Religions. Yep. And I'm on now at 2936, 2936, right, every day. And it's just crap. Usually when I wake up, oh, the weather's nice, where are the birds? I hope so-and-so's asleep, you know, and just crap. Then I start my work, and the first thing I, part of my work is to listen to the angels and other spiritual beings sing. I don't take a long time. I'm taking about three seconds to make sure they're there and they're singing. They're there. It, it's quite orienting to realize that you're just part of a big thing. And, I mean, we think we're so damn independent. As I was preaching on Sunday, I said, we're owned by God. We're owned by the Creator. I mean, you can't be so stupid as to think whoever created the universe isn't kind of in charge of you. you you're owned by life and all that stuff. You're owned. Anyway, take the time, just three or four seconds to make sure, or when you start healing and being great, grateful, they're around too. The middle-sized angels are in charge, are, are, are mostly in the healing business. The enormous things like the archangels and stuff, they have different jobs. Okay. You know, and those little ones that, cherubs and stuff like that, the little funny angels. Oh, the they little have, scrubbing level angels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are so funny, that little tiny windy angels. If that pew sat 10 people, there would be 20 angels trying to sit on that pew. I mean, there's some of the little ones. But you know, we also can't see stuff. All those pictures of everybody, not just in the Abrahamic cultures, with halos, we used to be able to see that. In fact, I've, I've had two parents and then one grown up tell me their kids say they can see my halo. Once they grow up, they can't.
But I think it's a kind of, I mean, or they don't talk about it. But two mothers have told me their children have said that. And I thought, we all probably all used to see that. We're just not trained anymore. Not interesting to the brain. And then one grown up, so up at Camp Mitchell or something. <laughs> so I think we all have them. Okay. Just can't I'm see. I'm surprised we can see clearer at Camp Mitchell. What? See, I'm deaf. You have to yell. I said it doesn't surprise me that you see clearer when you're at Camp Mitchell. Yeah. Oh, maybe you do. I hadn't thought of that either. I, the, the last times I've gone to Camp Mitchell, I just work. I've never been just at something there. But one of my favorite is I do these Bible studies, what Lord are you saying to my heart? I've done them for years and years and years. And I was doing a workshop where we were going to do that. And you, your first question is, what Lord are you saying to my heart? And you listen, write down what you hear, and say, thank you, Lord. The second question is, what is, Lord, is my response to this? You listen, write down what you hear, and say, thank you, Lord. And the third question is, what Lord do you particularly like me? Remember, you listen, write down what you hear. And say, thank you, Lord. Then you share all that stuff. Anyhow, I didn't hear a thing. I'm running the workshop. <laughs> and I said, God, this is a demo. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the, we want to show not a damn word. <laughs> How to be an effective teacher. <laughs> not nothing to share. OK. Uh, Jane, what was the second question? What, what are you saying to my heart? Oh, no, wouldn't you know it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got it ready to I know. <laughs> what, what, Lord, is my response, response to this? What is my response? What would you like me to remember? And you say, thank you, Lord, after each time. Which is the long-term students just write TYL. I write out every day, thank you, Lord, but they all write TYL. I rarely hear more than a sentence, two. Oh, me either, me either. Word if or I've two. If I've got three sentences, I'm way, it's a lot. I know, I agree with you, but you've been doing it a long time. And God's not very chatty. No. <laughs> Nor are the angels, I told you that story, of a, I was speaking to one of my first spiritual director, and I said, Gabriel's not very chatty. <laughs> He said, can you imagine anything worse than a chatty messenger? <laughs> <laughs> get around to it. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Come get this thing so I don't feel I'm being recorded. <laughs> also, you know that it's being recorded, so you can go re-listen. Yeah. Yeah. At the, at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did this, do you, do you, I don't know what to do, but Ty knows what to do. And other people know what to do, too.